I'm Jamie Lewis, and welcome back to TheBasis.net. We're starting week number five of our eight-week quest called Game of Tones. And over the past four weeks, we've talked a lot about things that involve you going and buying something, especially if you're new to bass. You had to buy a bass and then strings and cables and all that stuff and uh, amplifier and speaker cabinets and microphones and DIs. Today, we're actually going to talk about something most of you have already. And also something that many bass players don't know how to use. I'm, of course, talking about EQ. Now, here's the thing. I'm not suggesting that if you're watching this video, it means you don't know how to EQ your bass. I'm sure that many of you do. EQ is one of the most powerful tools at the disposal of an engineer. And I just used a really, really important word. Engineer. Are you an engineer? Are you a mixing engineer, mastering engineer, front of house engineer, monitoring engineer? Some of you are, but Many of you aren't, and that's okay. You're bass players. Your job, number one, is to play bass. The science and the engineering and that technical stuff doesn't have to fall on your shoulders. And quite often, as, as often as I can, I hire other people to do that stuff because I don't really like doing it. I would rather play my bass. So again, if you're a bass player, your number one goal is play the bass and play the bass well. Please do that because then you're going to make everyone else happy. But... If you can engineer and get a good tone out of your bass while you play awesome bass, you are miles ahead of everyone else. And that's what I'm going to show you how to do today. So before we dive into the world of EQ, we kind of need to ask the question, what is it? Equalization is a process commonly used to alter the frequency response of an audio system using linear filters. Everybody knows that. Now, setting textbook definitions aside, I think we all, in a general sense, understand what EQ is, right? Grab the bass or the lows knob and turn it up or down, and you get more or less of it. And same with the highs, same with the mids. Sure, cool, easy. Well, not so much. There's actually much more to it than that. And there are actually different types of EQs that you probably should familiarize yourself with. Now, the most basic type of EQ is called a fixed EQ. It's the kind you're most likely to find on your active bass or, or on your amplifier. Right, It's just three knobs, bass, mids, and trebles. Or maybe you got four, bass, low, mid, high, mid, treble. Or maybe you've got just two, bass and treble. Right, But the idea here is that they're fixed points. I, I don't know what frequencies they even are. I could probably look it up in the manual, but I can't select lows to be you know, 80 hertz or 60 hertz or whatever. It's just the bass knob. I don't know what the curve is or what the bandwidth is. So again, they're very limited in what they can do, and that's why they're the easiest to use. They're the most basic. So fixed EQ gives you the least amount of control. The next two, parametric and semi-parametric, give you probably the most control in your EQ. They're called parametric and semi-parametric because it gives you continuous control over the EQ's parameters. Uh, if you've ever pulled up a, a plugin in Logic or GarageBand or Pro Tools or something, and you see something that, you know, it looks like a line and you've got these dips that, that you're pulling up and down, and you can adjust how wide they go or how slim they get, that's your semi-parametric EQ. Like I said, they offer continuous control over the audio signal and, and it's divided into several different bands. So you can have a three band EQ, a five band EQ, a seven band EQ. And the only difference between parametric and semi-parametric is that with semi-parametric, the EQ points aren't fixed. So I could grab any number. I could bump 213.1 <laughs> or whatever versus on a parametric EQ, the number is 110. Or 500, but I can't go anywhere in between. And some bass amplifiers actually do have a feature very similar to the semi parametric EQ. Um, for instance, my Aguilar Tone Hammer 500, and I think this is also true of the 350, and my Aguilar OB3 preamp that's on all of my active basses has what's called a sweepable mid. So I can do a mid boost or a mid cut, and on a separate knob, I can choose what that mid frequency is. Now, I don't know what the number is because the numbers aren't labeled on my bass and nope, they're not labeled on my amp either, but I can kind of sweep through and the lower the knob goes, it's low mids and the higher the knob goes, it becomes high mids or anywhere in between. So again, that is a semi-parametric feature that my mid-range knob on the, on the amp and the bass um, have. I'm pretty sure that sentence didn't make grammatical sense. Oh, well, next would be the graphic EQ. And actually, some of your bass amps might have this one, in addition to your fixed uh, EQs. So, like, if I remember correctly, 
I used to own an Ampeg SVT4, and it had a fixed bass, a sweepable mid, and a fixed treble knob. But then it also had a graphic EQ in the middle. And so all that is, it's, it's a bank of sliders that control fixed points. So typically they're between like seven and 31 bands, and you would have one at 30, one at 60, one at 100, 150, 220. And like, I can't get in between there. And, and again, I can't adjust the Q or the, the slope of it, but I could grab those specific frequencies and boost them or cut them. And the last EQ we're gonna go over today that you should know is called a shelving EQ. Now, this is probably included in one of the four EQs that we went over already. Uh, for instance, in, in, in Pro Tools or Logic, whatever you're using, if you pull up an EQ plugin and you do a, a high cut or a low cut where it just rolls off all of the low end or it rolls off all the top end, that's a shelving EQ. So there's something called a high pass filter, which is the same as a low cut. And I know it doesn't make sense, but low cut means I'm cutting the lows. High pass means I'm allowing the highs to pass through, but not the lows. So see what I mean? It means the same thing, but in reverse. And then the opposite would be a low pass filter or a high cut. A low pass filter allows the low end through, but not the high and calling it a high or a high cut is obvious. It cuts the high. See what I mean? Like I'm already getting confused with what they are, but high pass, low pass, low cut, high cut. They mean the same thing, but it can be kind of confusing. So then which of these EQs is the best? Well, the answer is neither. It always comes down to what are you trying to achieve? Do you need precision? Are you trying to hone in on a very specific frequency range and do something very specific to it? Or do you just need to grab a couple of knobs that the manufacturer has deemed, oh, these are the good frequencies, and you just twist them until you make it sound good, and then, okay, cool, let's go ahead and start playing. Right tool for the right job. So now that we have a basic understanding and vocabulary for what EQ is and all the different types, how do we use them to create killer sounds on the quest for tone? Well, it always comes down to what you're trying to do. You see, there's two different schools of thought for, for how to EQ. One is to EQ something to fix a problem. The other is using EQ to create a character or a vibe or tone. So if you want to fix a problem with your bass or, or fix a problem that your bass is creating, that's called surgical EQ, or we can also call it corrective EQ. Let's say that there's a specific frequency on your bass that just sounds bad, sounds really ugly. It might maybe it's really nasally or it's really boxy sounding. Okay, I'll sweep for it, I'll find it, I'll dip it out, and now we're good. Or let's say that you and the kick drum aren't playing nice together, because remember, there's another instrument in the band that loves low end, and it's your drummer's foot, right? The, the kick drum. Okay, so I'll cut some spots on him and boost some spots on you and, and just get the those two instruments to play nicely and sound like one instrument, like they're supposed to. Um, or maybe your signal was recorded too bright. Maybe you've got just a lot of click, a lot of attack, and it's just kind of piercing it's hard on the ear all right well i'll do a high end uh roll off or a low pass filter you know and we'll get we'll just kind of mellow the sound out a little bit so those are all examples of fixing the sound or fixing a problem with eq surgical eq so then it becomes really obvious which eq to use for surgical purposes shelving eqs and semi-parametric right? Because I want precision. I'm going for where's the exact frequency to roll off and how do I roll it off gently or really sharp? And, and when I dip, do I dip like this or do, is it more, you know, more pointy? We're honing in on very specific things and you're not going to get that with the knobs on your bass or the knobs on your amplifier. Okay. So let's say that I'm not trying to fix a problem. I want to use EQ for tone shaping. I want to use EQ to create a sound. Well, rather than going for my semi-parametric and my shelving EQs, I should probably grab my fixed EQs. Think of it like this, the Ampeg SVT has been around for a long time. And rightly so, it sounds amazing. It's a great sounding amp. And it's got very specific spots for the bass knob, the mid knob, and the treble knob. And they work. How do I know they work? The amp's been around forever. <laughs> We're still using it. I still see it on stage. So it's kind of idiot proof. Grab it, twist those things so you like the way it sounds, you're ready to go. You really don't have to think too hard. Or think of uh, if you're into recording the Neve 1073. Oh my gosh, one of the most amazing preamps of all time. You've heard it on countless records. And that thing, again, it's almost idiot proof. Plug into it, grab knobs and start twisting, and it's going to sound amazing because Rupert Neve chose those very specific frequencies, and rightly so. It's a beautiful, great, lush sounding preamp and very expensive too. <laughs> 
Now, I'm not saying that you can't use shelving and semi-parametric EQs for tone shaping and, and vice versa. You can't use fixed for, for surgical. I mean, obviously, use what you have. If all you got is plugins, use it. If you all you got is the knobs on your amp, nothing on your bass, well, that's what you're going to use. <laughs> you know, Use what you have, but understand that if you use each type of EQ for its strengths, you're just going to get the best results quickly. Okay, so now let's get practical. How do we actually use all this information that I spent the past like 15 minutes sharing with you, which I'm sorry it took so long. I hate being boring. Uh, but yeah, how do we actually use this? What, where can I use this on the gig or in the studio? All right, so, so here's one example. Let's say you're playing in a bar or a club. Chances are it's not acoustically ideal because it's a restaurant. It's, it's not a recording studio or a concert venue. So you're going to have problem frequencies with your bass. There's some notes that you're gonna play that are louder than the others. And that's that's a bunch of science and physics on room modes and stuff, which I understand a little bit, but I'm really not good at. So I'm not gonna bastardize that and butcher all that right now. But you, you know what I'm talking about. You're playing, if you were to just play a chromatic scale and you go, e, uh, 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 like that one note was louder than the rest of them. Why? It has to do with the room. It wasn't you playing it harder. Okay, so how do we fix that problem? Okay, check this out. Hopefully you have an amp with a sweepable mid, which again, most bass amps have these days. Okay, cool. So here's what I do. I go to my amplifier and I boost the mids all the way up. Bass is flat, treble is flat, but mids, I crank them. And then I start doing my chromatic scale, whatever, and with hopefully, like, I'll tap the notes with my left hand, right? Just to get sound. And with my right hand, I'll grab that sweep knob and I'll search for where does that note just get what? Like when does it just overflow and, and way, way too loud? Cool, I found it. That's called sweeping for a frequency, right? So I'll just go this way, that way, this way, that way. Where does it sound too loud? Oh, I found it, it's right there. Cool, then I'll grab my mid and instead of boosting it, I'll cut it. You just use your amp, your sweepable mid, for surgical EQ. You, there was a, a note in the room, it wasn't your bass's fault, but your bass was causing a problem. So you boosted, you swept for it, you found it, you cut. And there you go. Now you have a great sounding bass in that room. Now the EQ on my amp is set so that the room is even. There's no notes on my bass that are jumping out and hitting you. So then I'll use the EQ on my bass for tone shaping. I'll create sounds with that. So let's say the song we're doing is a slap tune. I, I bump up the treble, I scoop the mids a little bit, and I'll roll up the bass a tiny so you know I got some thump. Cool. Next song's a rock tune. I'll do the opposite. I'll mellow out the treble and the bass, and I'll crank the mids and get some punch out of it, right? So tone shaping here on my bass, surgical on my amp. Now I'm sure there's at least one question you're wondering, which is whether I'm trying to be surgical or whether I'm trying to be creative with EQ, where do I boost and cut and by how much? Well, the how much part is actually really easy. However much you want. It's kind of like saying, how much salt do I add to my food? Do you like salty food? <laughs> then add a lot of salt. Uh, you know, or do you just want to do like a little pinch at a time and do a taste and oh, it needs a little bit more. You're going to know when it's right because it's your taste. Now, where you're going to do your cuts and your boosts, that one is a whole different matter. And there's so many variables that it's not even funny. So I can't tell you, oh yeah, always do a cut at 432. I mean, it's not that precise. Because think about it, if you're doing this on a mic'd bass cab, well again, remember from last week, there are so many variables. You could have uh, you know, mic placement, distance from the speaker, different speaker types, different amplifier types, different microphone types. I mean, I mean, the, the there's those numbers alone. Then think about your bass, the types of woods. Rosewood's gonna sound different from maple, different from uh, mahogany, different from an alder body, uh, different electronics, uh, pickup configurations, string gauges, uh, all the different components, your hand placement, how hard you attack. Oh my God, I'm running out of breath just thinking about all the variables. So the specific numbers of where you're gonna boost and cut will change from not only instrument to instrument, but hour to hour, minute to minute, just how awake you are while you played. <laughs> all those things are gonna come into play as far as where you need to find your frequencies. Now, I do have some good news for you. It's not like I'm sending you out blindfolded saying, well, hey, good luck. I hope you can find those frequencies. Hope you can make your bass sound good. Go find them, right? It's kind of like fishing. I can't tell you exactly where to drop your line. It's like, hey, throw it here and reel it in. You'll catch a fish. 
but I can be like, hey, you know, this part of the lake, it's great fishing over there. Go three miles up. No one's ever there, right? So I'll let you know where to start. I'll give you some specific frequencies that you can go fishing for, and then you can find it. So if you want more or less growl in your bass, try searching around 600 to 800. If you want to hear more or less of the finger tack or the pick, go ahead and fish for that between 850 and 1.2K. You can probably just about always pull down somewhere between 400 and 500 because these are the boxy frequencies. Somewhere in the ballpark of 120 to 250 is often way too boomy and it makes the mix sound really muddy. So cutting around here is usually a good idea. So that's EQ in a nutshell. You now know the basics of what EQ is, how to use it, and where to go fishing. Now keep in mind that this is a broad stroke lesson uh, that, that is so much more in depth than this. But this is just enough to get you started. And also keep in mind that EQing and engineering and, and all these things are really instruments in and of themselves. Engineering is as much a craft as playing an instrument is. You spend five to eight hours a day practicing, a mixing engineer spends five to eight hours a day. And that's why when you listen to a record, it sounds different than someone who doesn't know what they're doing. Because there's a craft to finding the right spot and boosting it and tweaking it and making it gel with everything else. So if you're struggling with this, that's the reason why. It's the same reason you struggled with bass when you first picked it up. It's hard. It takes practice. It takes repetition. And it is a craft that you'll need to work on. So that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed that lesson. Make sure you're following me on social media. I'm at Jamie Lewis on Twitter and Instagram and at Jamie Lewis Bass on Facebook. Come find me there. I'd love to get to know you. And please stop by thebasis.net. Check out our memberships. They are super affordable. And I can't wait to see you again. Make sure you stop by next week when we continue the quest for tone here at thebasis.net. Hey, if you like what I do, please click on the subscribe button right here. And if you really like what I do, then click over here to see how affordable it is to join me at thebasis.net. But if you just want the free stuff, then click here to check out whatever YouTube's sophisticated robots think you should watch next. I'm sure they know what's best for you.